Hi everyone, we are Team Clio. We are the Fendi Penny Machine. Today we are going to in depth talking about how we came up with the idea and how we'd like to implement the idea into a robot. Currently, there are approximately about 800 music festivals in the United States. According to Billboard.com, there are about 32 million people attending U.S. music festival each year, and the number increases throughout the year. Based on the graph shown, you could see that the overall number of concerts happening in the world increases throughout the year, except in 2020 and 2021 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. All of those show how big the festival industry has grown. The number of the book also attracts many industry as it could generate an enormous amount of profit. Coachella, one of the biggest music festivals in the United States, could reach approximately about 100 114 million in profit. Although music festival brings lots of advantages in many sectors, it also comes with undeniable disadvantages. A music festival leaves a ton of trust behind, which could create an environment environmental hazard. Based on thisresult.com, Coachella could produce up to 107 ton of trash each day. Hence, by using Coachella as the main subject of interest, Team Clear decided to make a device that tackles this issue by making an automated penny cleaning robot with, which will ensure facility cleanliness while also reducing cost and cleaning effort. As you Focus more on Coachella, we did research to firm, firm know the current condition of the concert. As it is just recently happened, we asked several of our friends to went to Coachella that went to Coachella to take some pictures of the venue and, and the surfaces. Here are some of the pictures. As seen from the pictures, the ground could be considered really, really flat and the grass is short. Moreover, we also found out that the venue is a polo field, which we could assume that it is well maintained and flat. We also can see that most of the trash reposed on plastic bottles and plates. So, to fulfill that requirement, this robot will utilize technologies such as wood sensor, hot sensor, sweepers, and cleaning process system to collect the plastic bottles and plates. In addition, Computer vision is also going to be used to detect any object on trash and lock, which can allow the bot to maneuver through them. So there are several design ideas proposed by the team. However, the highlighted queen is finally chosen for the final design. First is the trash collection method. At first, there are four options, which are front cylindrical brush, rear cylindrical brush, vacuum, and raking system. Often come with disadvantages and advantages. In the case of Coachella, front cylindrical brush is the most visible of all. Rear cylindrical brush was not chosen because it requires additional vacuum mechanism to make it work perfectly. While we would like to prevent the usage of vacuum because we don't want the vacuum to suck out all of the dirt to the mechanism. So, from previous explanation, we could also conclude that vacuum is not a feasible option for Coachella. Lastly, raking system was not chosen because it might damage the grass and the dirt. Moving on to the second design consideration, we chose six wood mechanism due to the traction it gives. Caterpillar track was chosen not chosen because we are only dealing with a flat surface and caterpillar track will be useless in that condition. Manual disposal also chosen as a trash disposal system due to its simplicity. At first, the group was leaning towards the usage of piston mechanism to make sure that everything could work automatically without the help of manual labor. However, due to this, the time constraint we have, we decided to focus more on the trash collection and objection object detection more. This caused us to use manual disposal for the final design. Also, passive storage was also preferred by us due to the same reason, as we would like to focus more on the trash collection and object detection more. Lastly, computer vision and that estimation was chosen by us as it will give us the most detailed feedback and detailed feedback compared to the others. There are two initial designs proposed by us. 
the one on the left is model one. So this is how the system of model one will work. As it is moving forward, the trust will go under neutral, but on the reverse mechanism will try to pick up the trust, transfer the trust to a conveyor belt. The rotating conveyor belt will directly transfer the trust to the bin, as seen in the picture. To indicate the fullness and capacity of the bin, several sensors as weight sensor and height sensor were applied to the bin to make sure that it would not overflow. When it reached the maximum height or weight, the trash picking process will stop, and the robot will move to a designated area. In the designated area, the trash will be dumped either to a container or ground by opening the lights in front of the robot and pushing the trash out using the piston mechanism shown in the picture. However, this mechanism has several disadvantages. First, as previously mentioned, in order to use the rear cylindrical brush, it will need an additional vacuum to make it more efficient. But in the case of Coachella, we couldn't use any vacuum since we might be dealing with dirt, and we don't want the dirt to get into our mechanism. So, to overcome that problem, there was Model 2, where we changed the orientation of the cylindrical brush to the front. In this case, the brush will be held by a scoop like mechanism to pick up the truss to the robot. This would be a much more feasible option for Coachella. As based on our research, the turn will be flat and only inhibited by a short, short, short grass. The rest of the overall design remains the same. However, Model 2 still needs additional modification after a further consultation with professors and DA. So, Game Model 3, the last and final design. There is no significant difference between Model 2 and 3. The only difference is that the group changed the piston mechanism to a manual bagging due to the time constraint we have. The group would like focus more on the trust picking mechanism and the automation of the robot, as it is the core and the main function of the robot. From the, from the design of Model 3, the group will also design a prototype, where we are only focusing more on the through the sweeper, brass mechanism, and the automation of the robot. As you can see on the image, design was made as simple as possible just to achieve several goals that already decided by the group. First, the group would like to show the autonomous driving and collection system, as it is the main function of the whole product. Without the fully functioning autonomous movement, the robot will be useless. Second is object recognition. Object recognition needs to be working in order to determine objects on track. This will help the robot to determine where should it maneuver. Third, of course, a third, of course, a working sweeper mechanism. Without a perfectly work running sweeper mechanism, the robot will be useless at least as it won't pick any trash. Fourth, we would also like to make sure that the trash could be transferred to a bin. Last but not least, the group will also ensure the structural integrity of the robot foundation. Moreover, I'm also working on the power calculation for both prototype and full design. For the prototype, the power all Raspberry Pi, two drive pin motors, and one sweeper motor, the prototype approximately needs about 12 volts and 15 ampere. In that case, 11.1 lithium polymer. 6 ampere per hour with 100 C battery was chosen to power the prototype. An additional 5 volt regulator was also used to make sure that the Raspberry Pi is not overpowered. For the full design, the power needed is still being calculated as the central processing board is still to be determined. This calculation is approximately done within this week and a sufficient battery will be found. However, the full design will most likely use a lab acid battery as it is cost effective for storing sufficient power and energy. Okay, now that we've uh, explored some of the context, the problem we're trying to solve, along with uh, requirements necessary to do so, uh, we can now take a look at our full assembly CAD, uh, which is pictured here. And uh, now we're going to take a closer look into some of the individual subsystems that are involved. 
The frame was designed to house all the other subsystems, consisting of the electronics, the storage, the conveyor belt, and the sweeper unit. The shape was kept simplistic so as to not complicate the assembly process, and the beam positions were adjusted as time went on to properly provide space for mounting the base plates and other subsystems. The frame is designed to be constructed out of half inch by half inch square aluminum pipes as welded together, with total dimensions of 61 inches by 36 inches by 21 inches. The beams were adjusted from the CDR based on the results from our FEA testing, which indicated that the factor of safety was much too high, and thus this assembly had an unnecessary amount of material. The base plates were also changed from carbon steel to ABS as polycarbonate due to the excessive amount of weight from the metal plates. In, sh in short, the assembly it was it was made it was made lighter it was made lighter, and the components were made thinner or, 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 or from the or from week five. The aluminum beams were kept from the CDR due to the ease of use, lightweight, and material strength, and was shown to be sturdy enough to withstand the necessary amounts of force. Cross beams were added to the back and the bottom to provide additional stability against shear stress and twisting in the chassis, as well as to provide additional mounting points. Some alternatives for materials that were rejected were aluminum T-slot beams and gusset plates, which were significantly easier to assemble but not, co but not cost efficient enough to justify their usage for mass reduction. However, we chose to use them for the prototype as they have similar material strengths to the main assembly, are considerably easier to assemble in the given time frame of the class, and are more adaptable to changes in mount, in mount designs and system positioning. Another alter alternative that was rejected was PVC pipes, also due to their cost efficiency as well as their inferior material strength and manuf manufacturability for a large assembly. To demonstrate the structural capabilities of our assembly, we ran FEA simulations for the assembly, depicting the, weight, the effects of weight and external forces on the chassis and supporting rods in the subsystems. The main simulations run were dynamic loads for the robot in motion, although several static loads were simulated for, for idle states. The simulations were run based on the assistance material strengths, which were ma mainly 1060 aluminum alloy, as well as ABS polycarbonate base plates. The static load was run to ensure that the st uh, structure was sturdy enough to hold up under its own weight, as well as, as determining the upper limits of trash that it could carry. The results were conclusive in showing that no reasonable amount of weight would create significant distortion in the parts, with the assumption that the motors or screws were likely to fail before them. The, the dyna dynamic loads were simulated for the robot in motion at, at its projected speed of 2 meters per second and the appropriate subsystem weights. The robot was subjected to localized fortresses, including shocks to the front and side for the scenario of it being kicked, and shocks to the top, or shocks for the top for people sitting or heavy, land, heavy objects landing on it. The forces were simulated as shocks by setting any of the force curves as spikes of impact rather than constant weights, and were localized by specifying an area of impact based on the predictive factor. A sample of our testing is depicted on the right, showing the results of the structural analysis for the robot in constant motion without external forces. The projected stress and displacement are mapped across the assembly, and the necessary factors of safety and displacement calculations are made to determine the suitability and durability of the design. The conclusion was, that was made was that the chassis itself would not fail before one of the weaker attachments, such as the motor or screws, while the support rods were holding up the you know, support rods holding up the conveyor belt and sweeper were able to withstand reasonable amounts of shock before reaching the yielding point. These these conclusions were made based on uh, based on the factor of safety, which it, which were co which were consistently at at at, reasonable, at reasonably high amounts, and the amount and the displacement, which were minor enough that uh, minor enough that they would not significantly affect uh, the the, rob the robot's actions. Additionally, we made the decision that the robot would not be designed to handle large forces on a regular basis, focusing more on object recognition and avoidance to avoid most issues of collision and environmental damage. Hi, my name is Jonathan Sheridan, and I was in charge of designing the sweeper and scoop subsystem. So it all started with the main problem, how do we collect a variety of trash from the ground at Coachella without destroying the grassy terrain? And the solution was a sweeper similar to what you might see on a street cleaner with a scoop below it to wedge and transfer the trash to a conveyor system. Initially, the sweeper was on the back side of the bot, and the idea was to catch trash with the sweeper, but this would require the sweeper to apply force against the grass, and we didn't want to cause damage to the terrain. So instead, we moved the brush to the 
front of the bot and we use the scoop as a wedge to trap trash and wedge it up into the bot. So for the original design of the scoop, you can see it's about as simple as it gets. It's just a flat piece of sheet metal folded twice. Um, and the problem with this was how are we going to integrate this with the conveyor belt system? Because the scoop is one of the lowest points on the bot. So how will conveyor belt successfully collect the trash? It has to be below the scoop. And our solution was an incline scoop. You can see that reflected in the second design. Uh, but there was a slight problem with this. The incline was too steep and we were worried trash would struggle to get over it. Uh, also, the scoop was unnecessarily deep. Uh, so we reduced the width and decreased the angle of the incline. Something that's nice about this design is the scoop is cheap. It's just sheet metal and it's easily manufacturable. You just cut and fold it into shape. At this point, our prototype was being designed and something really important to me was that the scoop and the sweeper could move forward, backward, up and down all independently of each other. This would allow us to run future testing and find the most optimal position. I calculated the proper sweeper motor requirements and the motor was sourced and ordered for the prototype and the proper coupler for the motor and the sweeper axle was sourced and ordered. Uh, I decided to have ball bearings press fit into the prototype sweeper mounts and the mounts were designed with the help of Robert and Jan. After our parts arrived, uh, I saw that the sweeper axle was just a bit too big to fit the bearings so i ended up having to sand the axle down to size on both ends but we made it work eventually uh, and then the sweeper and the scoop subsystem was fully assembled with the help of robert now if we look at the sweeper and scoop prototype design we can see there are three variables to play around with the height of the scoop the height of the brush and the distance between the two if each variable has approximately five possible values a uh, quarter inch apart, that means we would need to run 125 real world tests with our trash data set. In order to avoid wasting time, we're going to run a basic filter test with an empty water bottle with each combination just to remove the failing outliers from the final pool and save some time. I designed a repeatable trash collection test to give us the most effective scoop and brush location combination. The idea is to get a wide spread of trash volume and weight combinations to see how each positioning performs under many different circumstances. On top of the bottles and cans listed here, a group of miscellaneous trash will be recorded as well to account for the wide variety of trash we expect uh, at a music festival. Things like plastic cups, bags, paper plates. This same set of trash will be collected with every individual positioning of the brush, brush and scoop, and the collection success for each piece of trash will be recorded. From this data, we can find the positioning which collects the highest percentage of litter. As of recording, these tests have not yet been performed, but we plan to complete them before the end of the quarter and the final data analysis will be available in our written report. The most efficient positioning will also be reflected in our final product design. Hello, this is Robert and I'm going to talk about the conveyor. So in the beginning of the quarter, we all drew these schematics to figure out some of the dimensioning and uh, integrations with the rest of the subsystems. Uh, so here's mine for the conveyor. Uh, and since then, we've gone through several iterations based on its placement uh, within the assembly and uh, some of the products that we uh, were looking at. Uh, the length remained about the same uh, as we expected. However, the incline uh, had to be at a greater angle. Uh, but we'll talk about that in a few slides. Uh, we figured out the width of half a meter based on the sizing of the brush and scooper intake system. Uh, we also knew that we would need cleating in order to move the trash up the incline, but uh, we figured out the specific dimensions of that based on the size of a water bottle. Some additional features are these sidewalls, which will prevent trash from falling off. Uh, but in the case that it does, we also have this plastic ramp placed 
to protect uh, all of our electronic components, uh, which will be underneath the conveyor. Um, but yeah, this is our conveyor uh, and its integrations to the chassis. Uh, in terms of the product, we initially expected to have to uh, manufacture this from the ground up. However, we quickly realized that it would involve uh, an unrealistic amount of labor and uh, assembly. So instead, we did a survey of several companies that offer custom conveyors. And what we landed on was MIPR Corporation. Uh, here's a photo showing an example of one of their products, which we think would closely resemble the one that we were to purchase. But they allow for several uh, customizations, including the length, the width, uh, the choice of the angle, uh, the belt type, if you want cleating or not, and um, the size of the pulleys that you would need. Uh, a particular aspect that interests us about this product, though, was the material of the pulley, or sorry, of the conveyor belt, which uh, would be resistant to staining and uh, resistant to other damages, which is important uh, because of the nature of its use would be trash and outdoor. But yeah, here's the product that we would buy for our full assembly. Uh, in addition, I also worked with JN on some of the systems integrations. So we'll start over here with the connection between the sweeper, the scooper, and the chassis. Um, the motor will be directly mounted to the spinning brush. And using this beam, it'll be fixed in line with the scooper. Uh, we'll have these mounts that are connected directly to the chassis, along with this long aluminum rod, which will not be fixed. And instead, it will have bearings placed inside, which will allow for vertical adjustments of the entire intake system based on changes of the terrain. Uh, and it will roll on uh, these two small wheels that are free spinning. Uh, but the dimensions uh, of the sweeper's placement from the scoop, along with the size of this wheel, are yet to be determined based on the findings of our prototype testing. Uh, now on to the conveyor's connection to the chassis. The conveyor needed to be placed slightly above the storage and slightly below the scoop, which is why the angle was uh, much higher than we expected. Uh, but yeah, it's gonna have these um, aluminum components welded directly to the chassis and to the frame of the conveyor. So in addition, I was also in charge of assigning group members their tasks for the week uh, and also recording the weekly update video. But with help from Michael, we were able to compile these two parts lists. Uh, the first one was for the prototype, and this was really useful in organizing the different parts we need for each subsystem and keeping track of what we needed to order and uh, what had already come, along with ensuring that the total cost was below $600. Uh, we also made one for the full assembly, uh, and this is important because early on we calculated that in order to remain profitable for the two weeks of Coachella, uh, the cost of manufacturing per bot needed to be below $2,000, and uh, it would vary depending on the customer's specifications for uh, battery power and motors, but from what we found, we should be in that range. Hello, my name is Ashley and I did the storage for this project. Uh, so in our storage container, pretty much what's going to happen is it's going to fall right underneath the conveyor. So the trash is literally just going to land right in the, store, the storage bin. So for our prototype, we did a plastic tray, um, sort of like those pl plastic trays that you see for TSA um, when you're going through security, stuff like that. And um, for our full design, those are the dimensions. And then, so what's gonna happen is that once the trash gets in the storage and the storage fills up, then the plastic is gonna get taken out, emptied, and then uh, placed back into the robot. Um, no trash bags are being used here to make sure that this is an eco-friendly process. Um, so like I said, it's almost just like you're, you're just taking up the bin out, dumping it, putting it back in manually. 
So how are you gonna be able to tell when the trash is full? That's why we have these weight sensors. So um, to the left shows the what the weight sensor looks like without the storage bin on top. So it's gonna be a stainless steel weight scale. Um, I made it <clears throat> glass to show you in this model just because uh, transparency purposes, so you can see the fixtures itself. Um, but yeah, it's, it's gonna be stainless steel and it's a screw-in type of mounting. And then you could see each individual uh, weight load sensors. Um, there's gonna be four of them and then they're gonna be placed right there. And the storage bin is gonna be put on top. So the weight sensors will let the robot know when um, it gets near 50 pounds as that is our maximum. So we also need a height sensor just in case if there's uh, one massive piece of trash that is actually really small in size, but um, like weighs a ton. Um, so yes, yeah, so we have the height sensor and then this is going to be, and then there's four of them also in this diagram. And these height sensors are gonna hold, are gonna be attached with Arduino. Um, so they're made out of brass, brass plate fixtures. And there's also mounting holes for these to be able to detect when the trash is above a certain height. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jay and I'm going to talk about the drive train system of our drone and how our design changed along our design process. First, we designed the <coughs> drive train to be able to climb up a ramp by attaching the front wheels to freely rotate up and down so you can dump out the trash at a certain height, but we changed our plan. so. We narrowed our scope to <clears throat> have it only go around the flat venues or fields. For the design we had for CDR, we had four driving wheels and two free spinning front wheels, and we put two more on each side using sprockets and chains. But we recognized that it would have unnecessary complexity with the chain and potential issues with turning with six wheels. So for the final design, we adopted four motors on each wheel with the wheel be bearings to make sure that the drive train system can handle the weight of the body. For our pro prototype for demo, we are using two motors on rear wheels and two free spinning front wheels. In terms of the imaging subsystem of our project, so in terms of how accurate we want our computer vision model to be, we want to make sure that our model is not only good in terms of high accuracy, but good in terms of high efficiency. By high accuracy, as we see in this image on the slide, I mean both good at localization and recognition. So if I were to give an example of trying to detect a bottle in a patch of grass in one frame of an image, by high localization, that means we're able to detect that the bottle is in a certain, is in a specific region of the patch of grass and not just anywhere in the frame. And by higher, and by recognition accuracy, I mean that we're able to detect the bottle for what it is and not as a can or a cigarette or something else. In terms of high efficiency, I mean that we're able to detect objects in the frame and also localize them in a reasonable time frame. So for example, if it takes, let's just say, only 0.7 seconds to detect an object in a frame, that'd be good for real-time purposes. But if it takes about four or five seconds to do so, that might mean that a robot, which is using our computer vision, might traverse a distance which is too long and we might have already passed the, the litter that we're trying to pick up. So that's by high efficiency, I mean they're able to use our computer vision algorithm in real time. 
as we see on this side where I'm talking about the data set, on the left-hand side, I have different Excel sheets which show the resolution of the data set they're using, which is the Taku data set for different classification purposes, which can be modified using a YAML file, which I could write easily. So the leftmost column we see of these Excel sheets, we classify pretty much everything as litter and everything that's not, that's not listed there is not litter. So this is just a binary classification problem. On the other hand, if we look at the rightmost column, we see that there's much more resolution to what we're detecting. So in terms of what we're using for our project, for the most, we only need to use the leftmost column if we're just trying to detect litter. On the other hand, if we want to do obstacle detection, detect something as something that needs to be avoided, then we might need something of higher resolution, so something further on the right. The image on the right we see contains the different classes which have been pre-labeled in the data set that we're using. So we see that there's many plastic bags, wrappers, and just bottles and bottle caps that are in the data set, but there are not many batteries and plastic gloves, which in reality shouldn't be a major litter occurrence at places like Coachella. And the image on the bottom right is just an example of an annotated image in the top of data set. In terms of the architectures that we'll be using for the computer vision, so in order to go over exactly what we're using, I probably need to explain a little about the theoretical background about each of these models. So going counterclockwise from the top left image, the top left image is an example of something called a spatial pyramid pooling network. So what it does is it's able to take an image regardless of resolution and scale that to something which can be input into a CNN of fixed size. So as we see here, we just take an image and then we break it up into certain boxes. So we have, let's just say on the rightmost side we have, so where my cursor is hovering, just one box. And as we go further on the left, we break it down into further subdivisions. And we just use those fixed bounding box sizes. And we just fix that into some vector which could be fed into a CNN. The bottom left image is an example of fast RCNN. So fast RCNN is an improvement of the classic, uh, classic RCNN architecture which uses the selective search algorithm to find 2,000 region proposals and then combine those using a greedy search algorithm. So what FastRCNN does is that instead of having to input those 2,000 region proposals into an RCNN, we're able to input the whole image into the RCNN and then afterwards find those region proposals. The bottom right image is an example of something called faster RCNN, which is an improvement to fast RCNN. And what that does is instead of using a selective search algorithm, we're using a region proposal network. So while fast RCNN might take about two seconds to process an image frame, faster RCNN might only take 0.2 seconds, which is much more realistic for a, a real-time purpose. And the top right image is an example of something called YOLO, which I'll be talking more about later. But YOLO is essentially an even further improvement to faster RCNN. As we see, what this does is that on the, where I'm hovering my cursor, we're able to detect class or bounding box confidences. And where I'm hovering now is also class probability. So you're able to do both of them simultaneously instead of doing them one by one. So we implemented three different architectures for our project. The one we decided to settle on was a YOLO architecture using PyTorch. And our frame processing rate was only 0.07 seconds per frame, which is obviously definitely real time. So we won't have a problem in terms of efficiency. In terms of accuracy, we could improve it using something called a sliding window model. So if our computer vision algorithm isn't able to detect an object in one frame, it might detect it in the next frame or the image before that. So if we average the accuracies over those two or three frames, we might be able to have a more accurate model that is able to skip over accidental accuracies in case those do occur. And the bottom right image we see on the side is just an example of what the output is from the terminal. So we see here at the very bottom, the frame processing rate of 0.074 seconds. And this is an example of our model actually working. So starting from the top left, we have an image of basically our camera over grass at a certain elevation. And as our robot continuously adjusts itself to center itself towards the object in question, we see that we further approach as my cursor is moving towards the object. And eventually once you pick it up, we move past it and we continue on. And as Chandra will talk about later in terms of navigation, there's a certain approach we take in terms of how we search for these trash. And in terms of potential extensions to our model, so right now the YOLO architecture that we're using operates on a frame-wise perspective. And for the most part, we think that's okay. 
However, another thing that we could use to better our model is spatial, tempo spatial temporal coherence, which means that instead of having to detect the same object if there's only one image every single frame, we could just use the output of one frame and assuming that a robot hasn't moved significantly, use the output from the prior frame and reduce basically the computational load for the following frames. So tubular architectures are just the video analog for bounding boxes and the actual, and the efficiency is about 0.488 seconds per frame, which is definitely reasonable. And accuracy should be improved since if something exists in one frame, we're just progressing it towards the later, progressing it through the later frames. And the architecture as we see in the image on the bottom left is a classic encoder, decoder, CNN, LSTM. So what's going on is that we have a tubelet CNN and a class and a classification CNN. The tubelet CNN basically stays static, while the classification CNN uses a fixed location at a frame X and it adjusts itself over a certain number of frames. And the image on the bottom right is an example of the algorithm. So basically the linkage algorithm in terms of how we link objects in one frame to, the, to objects in the prior frame is just an intersection over union score of the regions over those two frames, in addition to the objectness scores of both of those potential candidate frames in each of those images. And this is basically what Michael will be talking about in his next slide, so enjoy. Hey, so moving on to the Raspberry Pi integration, this step was to just make sure uh, everything was working together. Uh, more specifically, we have the Raspberry Pi, the computer vision software, and the navigation software, as well as all the hardware uh, components directly connected. So the camera, motor one, and motor two. Uh, right here, uh, camera motor one and motor two are connected physically to the Raspberry Pi. So uh, this is done by 16 wires from the camera to the Pi, as well as for the motors, it'll be a single wire connecting to the motor driver, giving commands to the motor driver on how to uh, control the motor, such as moving forward, um, going at this speed, or uh, uh, turning the wheels in a reverse direction. Um, so as a walkthrough of how each iteration of this, uh, this loop works, we can start with the Raspberry Pi. So on boot up, the Raspberry Pi will load, uh, load up all of its um, software. The first step would be to take a picture from the camera as input. Uh, Raspberry Pi will get the picture and directly send it to the computer vision um, uh, software. Computer vision software will take as input the, uh, the picture, which we'll call as frame because it's going to be a series of pictures. So it'll send one picture. The computer vision will determine um, where the trash is located in the picture and come up with a list of bounding boxes that it will then send over to the navigation software. The navigation software, uh, which will be explained a little more on the future slides, will uh, look at the bounding boxes and determine which trash to go after. Um, not only that, this also handles uh, some more complex navigation. So it'll do simple ones where it just follows the trash, but it'll also make sure to uh, keep the robot within grid lines, like a lawnmower pattern, as well as just making sure it doesn't go off the grid, um, and also ensuring that there is enough coverage over the entire field. The navigation software as output sends uh, a command, and this command is really simple. It's like, uh, turn left by 20 degrees, or turn right by 20 degrees, uh, or stop, uh, or face a different angle. Like, it's really simple but it sends back to Raspberry Pi, and the Raspberry Pi will have uh, code for its motor drivers that will properly handle uh, turning. So it'll give uh, maybe like motor one slightly higher speed, motor two slightly lower speed, and cause it to turn right, something like that. Uh, we just have a quick image demonstrating the initial uh, Raspberry Pi integration. Uh, we're hoping to uh, finalize the build this week in places entire software with the motors onto the Raspberry Pi. Just a little delayed on getting the motor parts. Um, but yeah, so rather than having a motor currently on the board right now, um, we decided to use the LEDs as a way to show what the, what the motors would be doing um, on the actual robot. So when I press play, 
the green LED turns on, telling me that the robot needs to turn right. So the motor will be activated in such a way that the left motor will be faster than the right motor, making it turn right. So notice the green arrow right here. Uh, the robot has turned that way, and now the red LED lights up because the motor needs to turn left. But the robot needs to turn left, so it turns left. And the robot will keep doing this, and since it has a number of degrees to turn by, it'll keep swiveling, maybe uh, targeting, maybe getting closer until the navigation software detects that it's at the center, red and green. And once it's red and green, the robot will move forward. Um, so one problem that was brought up was uh, while it's moving forward, the trash could exit the frame. And we're just handling this by making sure if it does leave the center, the robot should uh, adjust its turn as well. Once it picks it up, uh, LEDs turn off. Uh, just, this just represents stop the stop command from navigation. Um, one other part that we worked on kind of related to just the integration was a UI design. So in practice, a human operator will be uh, sitting there on their computers, uh, possibly managing a dozen robots navigating the field. And they will need a way to handle problems that come up. So the UI on the right has a video feed coming from the camera. Uh, which allows the operator to notice if something goes wrong. So if a robot isn't responding or, uh, you know, they're just browsing around, seeing what robots are doing, and they see uh, something bad in the photo, like someone attacking the robot, it will, the, the human operator will be able to control the robot by telling it what to do. It can make it turn, it's really simple, the way they control it. it. Like, they can't do anything too complex, but it should be enough to get the robot out of, like, a ditch or some other problem by using the left arrow, right arrow, forward and back. Uh, for debugging, uh, the human navigator controller, like if it notices a specific problem, can actually look at the specific outputs coming out of the robot. It can notice like what state the robots are in. Uh, so is it turning? How is it turning? And then like, is it moving forward? Is it stopping? Is it halting? Uh, what percent of field has been covered? Stuff like that. Finally, I just want to bring up that um, this chain of things is not part of our final design, such as like right now, we realize the Raspberry Pi doesn't run the computer vision software. So we're actually running this on a separate server outside and just having it connect through a network. Um, so we do want to get a board upgrade. Uh, one of the possibilities that we looked at and it's seriously considering is uh, this board right here. This board has an onboard TPU as well as supports uh, TensorFlow Lite really well, and it's really simple to convert between the two. Uh, and we get also a lower current consumption, 82 milliamps compared to the uh, Raspberry Pi 3 amps. Um, likewise, the motor selection that we chose has a max weight of 32 pounds. Like that's how we did our torque calculation. So we wanna just uh, make sure that even with trash, which we're expecting the robot to weigh at most 50 pounds, that it will be able to support at least 523 ounce inches and 10 watts. Cool. Thank you. All right, on to our actual progress. Uh, we've worked with the electrical board and some of the wiring. Uh, we laser cut these plates to connect our chassis and we 3D printed mounts for the spinning brush and scooper. Uh, we had a cutaway at some of the plastic container since we don't have a conveyor belt, but we were able to run some early testing on the spinning brush. Uh, we've also manufactured this aluminum sheet into our scooper using the machine shop. Uh, a problem we ran into was the bearings were a touch too small, uh, so we needed to chip away at some of the material of our spinning brush. But it seems to work great now, so here's where we are with our progress. Um, we just need to use those mounts to connect the scooper, uh, but our main goal this weekend is to get our drivetrain up and running so we can begin testing. Uh, so for our deliverables, we have a few tests we need to run. Uh, the intake system has three main variables, which is the scoop height, the brush height, and the distance between them. So we're going to run a variety of tests at these different positions using all this trash. Uh, it has different weights and volumes, so we should get a wide range of data. Uh, and we also have a few metrics for the navigation and computer vision that we wish to find out. Okay, design outcomes versus requirements. 
does the design collect a specified size range of trash? So the exact range of trash we can collect is going to become more clear as we perform real life testing. Currently, we expect to collect the majority of litter. From our research, most litter found at music festivals is small and food related, paper plates, napkins, and water bottles, those types of things. Um, the efficiency of our design is gonna vary as we test different configurations of the sweeper and the scoop. And eventually we're gonna find an optimal solution. It just requires some more real life testing. Does our design detect trash to be collected? Yes, using computer vision, we're able to differentiate litter from grass, from its surroundings, and we can navigate to it. Does it navigate terrain? Well, given Coachella is a music festival held on a polo field, it's safe to assume the terrain's gonna be uniformly flat, free of any holes or steep inclines, uh, and any other objects that'll be there can be avoided using terrain mapping software and distance estimation algorithms. Is our design as simple as possible? Of course, there's always room for improvement, but we've tried to keep our subsystems as simple as possible for you know, reliability and to keep manufacturing costs low. Is our design profitable? Our current parts estimate is about $1,500 and even if manufacturing costs exceed what one venue might spend on litter cleanup, our bots could be rented to events rather than sold outright, and we could earn a profit over time while still being marketable. This would retain the usual business model often seen implemented by venues of hiring a temporary cleanup crew for individual events rather than keeping a large janitorial staff year-round. Originally, we wanted our design to adapt to many different terrain types, but this problem is much more complicated than it first appears, and it would require a lot more time than we have available. Our current design still applies to Coachella, one of the biggest music festivals in the United States, and Empire Polo Club, the venue which hosts Coachella, actually hosts a number of different events year-round, any of which could use our design. Many music festivals, like for example, Beyond Wonderland, are held in paved outdoor event centers or indoors. So there are a variety of different music festivals or opportunities across the country and year round for our robot to be utilized and for us to earn a profit. Okay, in conclusion, our two major goals were to design a viable product that can autonomously clean flat venues within the requirements of our scope and to also construct a prototype that tested the major unknowns of that full assembly. Uh, so despite uh, many setbacks and illnesses, uh, we've gone through many iterations of design and uh, we think we've come up with the best engineering solution for the problem of trash at music festivals. Uh, and we hope we've demonstrated that to you during this presentation. Uh, so just moving forward, we need to get our drivetrain up and running, wire those electrical components, and conduct our testing. Uh, but Team Cleo, thanks you for your time. Uh, we hope you're doing well, and we'll see you on demo day. Goodbye.